Thank you for joining this panel where we'll explore whether or not a digitalized monetary system is in the making. Brazil's central bank governor lamented recently. He said, it is easier to move money from Sao Paulo to London by boarding a plane carrying bags of cash than it is to do it through the banking system. Presumably, he was suggesting that the banking system is obsolete, perhaps, and it is more expensive to do so, antiquated. It is also one reason why the monetary system needs to move with innovation. And to that point, more than 100 central banks, i.e. 80% of central banks in the world, are exploring or engaging or even embracing their own digital currency. They're hoping to reap the rewards of a system that's more efficient, that's more reliable, that's probably cheaper and more inclusive. There is potential for it to be more inclusive, to bring in the unbanked into the financial system. So how do central banks adopt new technologies shaping the monetary system of the future? Well, to get it started, I'd like to uh, invite our lead-off speaker, uh, Professor Athey, who joins us virtually. Professor, please. Please give a wave if anything's wrong with how this all is coming through. Um, it, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with everyone today, and I'm so disappointed I can't be there um, in person to, uh, to interact and learn from all of you. Um, and I also just wanted to say that uh, my comments today are my own personal opinions and not those of any institution. Um, I'm on partial leave in the U.S. government right now as well. So I wanted to make a few comments about the backdrop of technology in the financial system to help understand why we got here and also to help think about the forces around the monetary system that are shaping how it develops. Um, and so just to start with a few comments about digital transformation in the financial sector. One reason things are so hard at like the difficulty of moving money or, or making um, doing other types of fairly things seem, that seem to be simple with today's technology is that large organizations face challenges with both the incentives and the execution for innovation, particularly banks and government. This is a problem that's pretty hard to fix. Um, but there are some important trends that are changing and affecting this dynamic. One is a trend in how software is getting built and how digital, what, what digital transformation even requires. And that's a trend towards software as a service. A trend where instead of having to build everything internally, we have specialized vendors that in principle create and innovate for an entire sector um, they get scale economies and they compete in quality. And then firms, large banks, and governments don't have to take on the risk of IT projects, which so often fail and can be very difficult to do in large bureaucratic in, um, in, in organizations. Another very closely related trend is that artificial intelligence and machine learning and other types of technology developments are finally becoming more accessible. We're, we're seeing general purpose technology developed as well as operationalizable best practices and all of the, the supporting infrastructure around implementation that's finally getting um, sort of non-specialized, non-tech firms to be able to use the technology more effectively. We see things like these foundation models that you read about in the newspaper. Um, that have been analyzed a lot by an institute I helped found at Stanford on human-centered artificial intelligence. Um, this, these foundation models, um, basically what that means is that somebody with access to a lot of data and a lot of computing trains a very large artificial intelligence model. And then people can adapt it on much smaller data sets and with much, much easier compute. And you, you see these crazy things where you can type in a word and it spits back a picture or it writes an essay for you. 
Um, so right now, a lot of these are kind of gee whiz things you read in the newspaper, but they're starting to get more effective, and they they allow um, even small companies to be able to uh, use these models for prediction. So that's going to be an important trend going forward. And these examples are really just the tip of the iceberg. So overall, we're seeing trends now that finally, even though digitization is important, it's actually becoming easier and less risky to adopt. And that's, also, that's good for legacy institutions and governments and, and central banks. Um, but it's also important for entry. And it's enabling smaller firms to come in and, um, and have lower startup costs and an easier ability to get going. Um, it helps people develop mobile apps with different plugins instead of having to build everything themselves and so on. These are, these, these are important trends. A second, um, a second issue, though, is that even though those trends reduce one kind of risk, they increase other kinds of risks because we, we have now um, banks and institutions interacting with lots of different vendors, lots of different software as a service. They may be using algorithms that they don't even fully understand, algorithms that might be fragile, um, that might have um, biases that, that are hard to evaluate. And so we're introducing new kinds of risks, as well as systemic risks if everybody's using the same software and they have failures or vulnerabilities or cyber risks. So regulation is really going to need to adjust to this new reality. Um, just to be able to do our jobs in the regular course of business, um, to be able to process all the data that comes along, um, but also to regulate firms that they're using lots of different kinds of data and lots of different kinds of vendors. Um, regulators are just gonna need to understand data a lot more. What's the value of data? What's its use? Um, what are the public good aspects? What kinds of data sets need to be available generally. And that also brings up the issue of cybersecurity. Um, you know, the cyber crime and cyber risks create a huge global tax on our economy. Um, and we need to, there's so many public good elements and externalities involved in, in cybersecurity that's another really important role. And as everything becomes digital, we, we become vulnerable as governments and institutions and regulators, but also we need to um, really understand the privacy and data sharing um, needed to combat, combat both the cyber crime itself and also the ways in which cyber crime reaps rewards by exploiting vulnerabilities in our financial system um, and, and really creating the incentives for cyber crime because if you can use information to create false identities or, or engage in fraud, that's the incentive that, behind all of that criminal activity. So these are all um, different, different areas that, you know, new expertise that we're going to have to develop if we enter this digital world. A second area that I want to really highlight is the area of incentives, innovation incentives, um, and incentives to serve different kinds of customers. And part of the reason that it's hard to move money around the world is that in many cases, it's not profitable to fix the problem. Um, and, and that has to do with many factors, including market power. And one challenge is that you know, regulation and financial services is often focused more on safety and, and security than on and, and incentives to make sure everyone is served. And when, when those trade-offs are made, it can um, create incentives for people to create alternatives that go around the existing system. Generally, large incumbents benefit from the status quo. And so they're not very motivated to make changes. That's not a technology problem, but a problem of business incentives, regulation, and competition. For a variety of reasons, relating to customer behavior, as well as relating to other economic incentives, competition has not resulted in low fees and efficient services for many categories of customers, including people wanting to send money to different parts of the world, including low-income low consumers in many countries. Um, those segments of the market are underserved, small businesses and so on. Um, competition policy is sometimes effective, but in other cases, countries have gone to direct regulation, for example, the fees or fee structure, or they've targeted switching costs, or tried to create other enablers of, for entry and competition. Generally, though, when there are large fees on the financial rails that support the global economy, and especially if those fees are worse for 
smaller countries and smaller businesses, um, poorer consumers, that's a problem. And that's a problem that we need to be focused on, um, both because not solving it can create other risks and, of course, that that's just a part of, of inclusivity and, and global growth. The gap left over, these underserved, they can create opportunities for new businesses like cross-border payments to try to, or things that try to help customers avoid fees and so on. But regulation can actually be a barrier to entry. Now, some countries have innovated in trying to make sure that the regulatory burden is proportional to the size and stage of the business model. Um, they've also tried to provide regulatory clarity for firms that are solving old problems in new ways. Um, but regulatory uncertainty or high regulatory barriers can prevent the, that success. And when there's another problem that can occur, which is that if firms find it hard to enter and comply with regulations, you can get entrance from other types of companies that are evading regulations. Um, and basically, if you, if you don't provide an avenue for legitimate businesses to serve customer needs, uh, that creates a, 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 a sufficient scale to support um, illegitimate businesses as well. Um, and so getting out ahead of, of these problems and having regulation really support entry and competition in a safe way, um, I think is, is a really crucial challenge for regulators. Finally, you know, while creating a new technology may but not be enough to overcome barriers to entry, there is something that really promotes um, entry into the financial sector, and that is having access to or control over large groups of consumers. And we've seen digital platforms around the world enter adjacent markets, adjacent services, like a communication platform entering adjacent services, including financial services. And if you have access to a lot of consumers locked in, it's very easy to get them to use your adjacent services um, through self-preferencing or exclusive access and so on. Um, these platforms can really exert power over their adjacent services. I've done some research about this. I have a paper called Platform Annexation about how platforms annex adjacent services. So this type of, um, this type of, of uh, going into adjacent markets or getting in between financial services companies and their customers is something that we see happening. And in some cases, the platforms are, are becoming new middlemen or um, adding additional taxes to the financial system and something that we need to, to think about and keep our eye on. Um, so when you really control a lot of consumers, that is, that, that, that's a business opportunity. It's a business incentive. It's not necessarily about the technology you create, but it's about the control and the access to the consumers and creating bottlenecks. We're also seeing um, competition regulation coming into play around the world to address that concern. Um, generally to respond to all of these things, the AI, the technology, the competition issues and so on, we're seeing some um, regulators really trying to upskill, trying to hire technologists, to hire experts. Um, for example, the Competition and Market Authority in the United Kingdom is one such example. But it's really a large challenge for regulators around the world to gain the capability and the expertise and to adapt quickly enough in this environment of rapid change. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And she brought up a, a lot of issues to do with the trends in new technologies, regulation, whether it's fit for purpose, also the risks that may be involved. Let's get started. I mean, we talk about new technologies, how they provide an opportunity for a new, perhaps, monetary system, but it also comes with risk. It is disruptive. How do you find that balance? How are you looking at the issue, Eddie? Well, um, thank you very much. And first of all, let me join others to congratulate uh, the birthday of uh, Bank of Thailand. Uh, I think Susan has covered a lot of grounds. Uh, before I, 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 I cover the risk, maybe I'll talk a little about the trends as well. Uh, Susan is right in, in that uh, I think AI, um, machine learning, uh, has become a lot more accessible and banks are actually incorporating them into their internal operations. As AI and machine learning gets more popular, the power of data, the importance of data will actually come in. Uh, and I think it's actually important to find ways to make data accessible in a consent-based way. Uh, and that's why in Hong Kong, we actually uh, 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 created a uh, common data uh, infrastructure for all banks to access as a one-stop shop. And with the consent of their customers, they can access all data related to that customer, whether it's the payments 
or the uh, company registration uh, or uh, trade declarations, etc. And that makes, uh, makes it much more easier for the SMEs using their own digital uh, footprint to access affordable loans from the banks. Uh, and that also levels the playing field between the bigger banks and the smaller banks in that they have the same access to the sea of data. So I, 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 I do believe that, as Susan said, uh, AI and machine learning and the increasing use of data is one big, big, big thing that we will uh, see in the coming years. Uh, and as the regulator or central bank, uh, there may be a need to construct infrastructure that make it that much easier for banks to use data. Uh, but the second trend is uh, blockchain technology, which is really uh, coming in big. Uh, of course, blockchain technology or innovation covers a wide spectrum. It's not really just the very speculative uh, unbacked cryptocurrencies that we've seen uh, having problem recently, uh, but also stable coins, uh, central bank digital currency, or asset tokenization. So these are trends that are very new, but I think it will come in more in the future years, and they will potentially offer benefits, including uh, lower cost of transaction, high efficiency or access uh, for different customers. But of course, as with any other uh, new innovations, there will be risks uh, that are well covered by Susan as well, and, and that uh, you mentioned. Uh, apart from the traditional, the sort of a more sort of commonly seen operational risks like uh, cyber security, uh, dependence on third party uh, service providers, uh, operational resilience, uh, things like that. Uh, we are seeing new risks. For example, if you increasingly use AI or machine learning uh, for credit, there could be a risk that uh, there will be bias in your models, discrimination against certain groups of people. This is something that uh, we at uh, DHMA has actually issued clear circulars uh, to banks to make sure that they can avoid those risks. Uh, and the blockchain uh, uh, trend, uh, there could be even more risk. And we don't even know how to really get a good handle of some, on some of these risks because by nature, they are decentralized. Uh, the, it's not easy, they, they're, they're crossing boundaries and they're on chain. But, for the op but we can actually start from the off chain activities. Things like um, regulating the virtual asset trading platform that we are doing. We, are, we will be quick, uh, 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 shortly having a law in Hong Kong covering not just the AML uh, aspect of the trading platform, but also investor protection. So uh, if you want to establish a trading platform uh, in Hong Kong, you need to get the right license with the right uh, controls on your activities. Uh, the second is uh, the investor protection part, uh, which is about uh, uh, conduct regulation. Uh, and, uh, and the third part is stable coins. Uh, we are also creating another law uh, aligning with with the international consensus on uh, regulating stable coins if they come to Hong Kong. So there are areas that we need to have the right regulation as a foundation so that innovation can continue in a sustainable way. Otherwise, they will just go sort of quite wild. Cheng Yong, the key trends you're seeing and some of the risks involved. Yeah. Uh, first, congratulations on the 80th birthday uh, for the risk I think let me first say that I agree with you and Susan that uh, uh, especially during the pandemic, this technology development, AI, machine learning, all these things really changing the shape of financing market, in, especially in digitalization. But if I just narrowly focus on the technology blockchain and uh, uh, new technology related with uh, crypto, stable coin, and DeFi, I'm not so sure whether we are really seeing the benefit of this technological development recently. I was more positive before, but after seeing the Luna Terra, now the FTX issues, I, I think that the probably, you know, it's already 10 years that in, uh, you know, the new technology developed. But on the other hand, unlike the in, you know, uh, industrial revolution and IT technology, I, I don't know, but I'm a novice, but uh, I don't know whether we really see the real benefit of the, uh, you know, this new technology in at least monetary policy and the world. So I mean, in line with the, uh, major conclusion of the BIS chapter three of annual report that uh, this uh, you know, central bank should play a more important role and uh, the trust cannot be outsourced and automated or uh, decentralized. So probably you know, to really harness the benefit of this new technology, AI and machine learning is separate things, but uh, distributed like technology, probably central bank play, should play a more role. In terms of risk and regulation, 
Uh, I think Sujan mentioned the reputation risk, and uh, many private sector has quite different uh, pr uh, incentives. So it's very hard to harmonize. It's not just technology, as Sujan mentioned. It's more like harmonizing incentives, legal structure, all kinds of things. But I think in incentive for the public sector is also quite different. I've never seen that the government agency try to not jumping to having a regulatory power on this industry, because they are also worrying about the uncertainties, regulation. So at least in Korea, I don't know whether it's true for other countries, the traditional regulator try to you know, kick the can down the road and to <laughs> others. So you regulate, not me. So I think this private incentive and the public incentive difference, I think provide the room uh, for the regulatory uh, gap, which may increase the uh, risk uh, in this transition period. My third point, I'm very uh, happy to listen to Susan's uh, point that the monopoly of the existing institution is a key barrier. And uh, from an Asian perspective, I think the best example would be the global custodian in, uh, in, a, in a international money transfers. So if I have time, I'm going to explain, uh, explain more. But I think uh, how we're going to, I have a real hope that this new technology, this new lag technology, and what uh, Singapore and Hong Kong is now experimenting through the Enbridge and the Dunbar project, whether we can, whether this new technology can actually help to avoid this, uh, break this uh, monopoly power of existing global custodian in international uh, money movement. <coughs> the focus on safety may not be a bad thing. Risk reward of new technologies, Adrian. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Um, first of all, congratulations to the Bank of Thailand. Um, 80 years is very young, um, uh, and uh, may you have many, many more decades ahead of independence. Uh, I'd also say that um, you know the future, actually the present now, is digital, digital, digital. So we have to be here, whether we were pushed or pulled, to be here discussing this topic, um, and we have to be here to be relevant. I would say the risk reward, we talk about the risk of each particular digital technology or, or the players in the game. We have to think about the risk holistically of without them and with them. Um, and in particular around for our ability as central banks to ensure monetary sovereignty, ensure a, a, a unit of value um, remains amongst everything that we're doing. And those have been under challenge, um, uh, at least according to the advertising on, on the on the on the tin for many of these products that have arrived and, and some which have since departed. So you know we we're in the room. We have to really understand the risks both with the technology available and the risk of us not moving with them, where we become uh, less relevant or even irrelevant. Um, and, uh, and with all of the implications that can come with that. Uh, within uh, the central bank in New Zealand, you know, we're incredibly open-minded. In fact, next week we will be going through, I think it's our third um, consultation process with the public. Uh, consultation is critical um, for all of this, um, in particular around continuing to earn our trust, um, you know, the public trust us, to ensure that they feel there's competition uh, ensure that there's efficiency, but whilst maintaining that monetary sovereignty that is in there. So it's it's a it's a careful balance. I'm very pleased to hear that um, whilst it's 10 years old, the frontier hasn't moved on too far at all. There's a little bit of fear around first mover disadvantage, I think, around um, moving in on uh, regulating the technologies, but also um, bringing central bank digital currencies into the game. So, so. Um, <coughs> Uh, you know, that risk reward I think has to be thought holistically. For us, I don't see an alternative other than to truly be uh, open, uh, working with um, whole of government around, around data and privacy, working with the current uh, uh, banks and credit allocators uh, around the doing, and working with big technology. It has to be a very collaborative um, environment as, as we come. Speaking just from New Zealand's perspective, I mean, we stand to gain enormously. We, we have all of the hallmarks that Susan talked about, where you have a, a very uh, concentrated, dominated banking sector, limited incentives to um, disrupt themselves, uh, very few uh, concentrated points of failure around payment and settlement systems, very high costs of cross-border transactions. So, you know, we stand to gain enormously. Um, 
Uh, not so much on the inclusion side, we're already highly inclusive, but at the public themselves have told us they really want access to central bank money, whether it's in cash or electronic form, as, as a human right. They then also tell us they don't carry it, um, so getting the business case balance there is, is a really interesting one for us. Before we pick up on CBDCs, uh, Cecilia, your thoughts on the trends and the risks? Um, so first of all, uh, congratulations. Coming from uh, in my previous job, I used to work for uh, the Swedish Central Bank, which is on its 354 <laughs> years, so 80 years. Uh, yeah, keep it going. Yeah, I, I see, you, see you as a... As a as a very alert, very energetic uh, teenager, out of the puberty, <laughs> obviously. Uh, so, um, so congratulations on that. Um, so first of all, I think um, we, sh we should be optimistic. I mean, uh, we, we just have uh, experienced a number of years with globalization that has actually created a lot of good for uh, millions, hundreds of millions of people coming out of poverty and in increase their different choices in life. And I, I think the digitization forces have, have also, we also already see a lot of uh, improvement in, in people's choices and, and life, life, lives. Um, on the other hand, it's our job to, to kind of, to worry uh, and to think about, all right, how do we, how do we sort of uh, design uh, frameworks and policy and, and regulations and the like uh, for the good of, of our societies? And, and uh, this is a daunting task, for sure. Um, I, I think um, the payment methods, you alluded to that, or the difficulties of making cross-border payments, is, is you know, it, we build our systems for um, domestic needs, uh, working office hours. Uh, but we now find ourselves in societies where people are expecting to uh, uh, interact uh, with social medias 24-7. Uh, uh, and we stream uh, entertainments 24-7. So obviously, the financial systems also has to deliver 24-7. Um, and I, um, I, I think about ourselves, those of us who work in central banks and, and, and banks, uh, we work in the fiat money team. And we have more, much more in common, actually, uh, that divides us, and which is that we, we want people to stay in the fiat money system holding money uh, in, in, in euros, dollars, Swiss francs and the likes, we think that is a much better place to be uh, than being in unreliable uh, crypto or, or stable coins. The technologies that is coming, that is producing cryptos and stable coins and DeFi and the likes, uh, that might be promising, but, but my personal view is that what we've seen in terms of products in that, from that world hasn't been very uh, convincing at all. But it remains to be seen what comes from that world. Now, um, what can we offer? Uh, well, we can offer an update of the fiat money system. And as the uh, head of the BIS Innovation Hub, uh, that's exactly what we try to uh, uh, produce and offer to the central banking community. So we, we look at these new technologies uh, from two angles. Uh, we think about how can they uh, change the financial systems as we know them today uh, and disrupt them and, and what do we have to be mindful of when we conduct, we as central banking community conduct our objectives of, of providing monetary and financial stability. So that's one angle. But the other angle is, is also about seeing, okay, so these technologies come rolling against us, can they actually be used? to uh, update our, our offers in this fiat money sphere, as I, as I mentioned. So we, we get our hands dirty with different experiments, uh, DLT, DeFi protocol, etc., and see, is this something that can actually be used for, for the community? Uh, and we can, we like to showcase what could be done, uh, but uh, we, need, we, need, we leave to, need to leave to uh, uh, legislators, to executive powers of societies, um, and together with their central banks, respectively, to decide what should be done. Um, I'll stop there. Okay. As we look forward to the future of money, CBDC increasingly coming to the fore, of course, different central banks are at different stages of embracement, so to speak, of CBDCs. Is CBDC the way forward for a more efficient system? Addy, I mean, you've, you've looked into this in a, yeah. in a deep way. 
Yeah, I, I have to say yes, because we've been doing quite a few pilots on CBDC, uh, and uh, both wholesale and also looking into retail. But it, it will not be the only way forward. There are many different ways to solve problems. For example, cross-border payment, uh, by linking up uh, instant payment system is one way. Uh, it might serve the retail sector for a while, uh, or by uh, private stable coins in future, it could be another way, e-wallets that can be uh, uh, transfer uh, with value that can be transferred uh, across borders. But CBDC is actually holding a good promise uh, in cross-border payment for wholesale use, uh, including uh, trade settlement. And here, I thought uh, uh, Chang Yong just mentioned about the project Enbridge. Uh, it's just uh, finished a pilot uh, which involved uh, 20 banks from the four jurisdictions uh, which have participated, Thailand, Hong Kong, China, and also UAE, coordinated by the BIS Innovation Hub, using real-life transactions uh, through, and, and the use case was trade settlement. Uh, it's gone through for a while. So we're moving into the next stage, uh, which is to look at the legal governance and policy arrangements uh, and hoping that it will gradually move into an MVP uh, status with more central banks uh, joining in. So we're really hopeful that cross-border payments using uh, uh, a platform like Enbridge can cut costs. The pilot shows that we can cut costs by half and, uh, and make it much more faster, uh, turning from days into uh, seconds and more transparent. You know where, the, where your money is. So we're hopeful that uh, it will proceed uh, this way. And it also holds promise uh, for future use cases. For example, if assets were to be tokenized uh, increasingly in future, and if those tokenized assets were to be traded across borders, then a CBDC-based cross-border payment system will be very well fitted to be the payment uh, 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 infrastructure for that kind of uh, future financial transaction. So, you know, this is one thing that, that we've been working on uh, and we are hopeful that it will uh, proceed smoothly. Uh, but of course, the other leg of uh, CBDC is retail. Uh, on that, uh, it really depends on the individual circumstances of jurisdictions. There are jurisdictions that might find uh, retail CBDC attractive for financial inclusion purposes, like Bahamas, Nigeria, where they can distribute money in a much more efficient way. There are jurisdictions that might see retail CBDC as a means to reduce systemic uh, risk uh, if it's dominated by a few uh, payment system. But for Hong Kong, and I think in the same way Korea or, or, or Singapore, where we have very, very, very developed retail payment system, very diversified and efficient, we need to really think through what are the use cases for retail CBDC. You know, we, we can get fully prepared, we can do the legal governance technology preparation. But what in Hong Kong, what we are doing in the next year is to really explore with different financial institutions. Show me the use case that you can find for retail CBDCs. We can even design sandbox for you to try it out. But without a proper, sort of uh, a convincing use case, we will be a little hesitant to just roll it out for the sake of doing it. Because otherwise, adoption will be an issue. Uh, if nobody adopts a retail CBDC, why, why do you want to, uh, why, want to introduce it? So uh, wholesale, we are moving uh, really full speed ahead. Retail, we're testing out with uh, the private sector. I know in my conversation with Ravi Manon, he's talked about how there's greater value to be unlocked for wholesale, but perhaps more risk when it comes to retail. Your thoughts, Cheng Yong? Not surprisingly, we came to the same conclusion. <coughs> we just finished our own pro uh, pilots, uh, you know, which last one and a half years uh, recently, and then summarized some of our lessons now. But our conclusion is very similar. We see huge potential in introducing uh, uh, wholesale uh, CBDC, not just for the international transaction, but even domestically, it can significantly improve the PVP, DBP system with uh, permission uh, DLT system. So we see enormous chance to improve the current system introducing wholesale CBDC. As for the retail CBDC, as Eddie mentioned, since we have a really fully developed fast payment system already, and the financial inclusion is not our major objective. So we, uh, the user case is not that clear. At this moment, some proponents uh, say that uh, there can be, uh, you know, the user case, since Korea has many IT companies, if we introduce private, I mean, retail CBDC can 
expedite the, our IT companies to do more investment on, on the metaverse, you know, the NFT, uh, you know, uh, investment market kind of things. But uh, maybe that makes sense to the young generation who spend lion's share of their uh, daytime in a cyberspace, but I may be too old to accept <laughs> it right away. So I really have to think about uh, what kind of real value uh, it has. So, but I think we have to definitely, as you mentioned, you have to really see the real value of the, uh, you know, private CB, I mean, retail CBDC for the down on. But if I have some time, even for the uh, wholesale CBDC, especially for Enbridge and Dumba project, uh, I'm more interested in from a very high level discussion of whether this can be a chance to revamp uh, the, the, the discussion that we had after 1997, Asian financial crisis. At the time, we really think about how we're going to develop Asia capital market to recycle Asian savings. And then uh, we try many things to develop infrastructure, such as creating system in the region and the transaction system uh, in the region kind of issues. But at the time, we actually hit the wall because there's a lot of harmonization, legal harmonization, technical issues to reduce the fee, which is lower than the what global custodian actually charges. So in some sense, not the technology, but harmonization, legal issues, and all these incentive issues that Susan mentioned mm -hmm. actually was a bottleneck to develop infrastructure uh, within the region. And, uh, and so that we can avoid a certain time uh, period problem. But now, given that the Enbridge and Dumba project is leading this harmonization and technological development, I wonder whether this can be an opportunity to lift lock, and then we can develop the infrastructure which we can use to uh, in, in promote the Asia savings within the region. Mm -hmm. But having said that, I think one issue, which I, I know that you are doing the experiment, but I have some questions, because experiment is a smaller size, but how are you going to address the, this liquidity provider issue when you do the international transactions? For example, if some country uh, who is participating in this wholesale CBDC want to issue a huge amount of CBDC, maybe well above the reserves they have, then the people are worrying about the confidence and all this, you know, uh, you know the who's going to provide the liquidity when these things happen, <coughs> whether that size is relevant for the FX reserves kind of thing. So, so in some sense, global safety net issue coming in. So I wonder whether this can be an opportunity uh, to combine this global safety, uh, safety net issue with uh, uh, wholesale CBDC for the international transaction. What I'm thinking is, I may be jumping to the conclusion, but I'm thinking, we, you know, many Asian countries are not want to approach IMF or the BIS or others to ask for the liquidity service because of reputation problems during the crisis period or pre-crisis period. But the CBDC, uh, wholesale CBDC, has a programmability abilities. So whether we can actually program those kind of things in advance so that the countries can avoid to asking these things and avoid the stigma on these things. And then, you know, so this kind of global safety net disperse mechanism through international organizations or the major central bank can be programmed, pre-programmed in the CBDC transaction. That will address some of the issues that we have discussed after 1997. So I just wonder whether this kind of technology can allow this kind of you know, new changes so that we can achieve the, the goal that we forgot for the time after 1997. We know Powell came out to say that he wants to get it right. He's not in a hurry to be first. Adrian, you seem to be adapting that approach as well. Why, why the hesitance? Uh, you know, I'm not sure there's a lot of first leader advantage um, in this. It's something that we all have to kind of get there simultaneously, as um, Cecily was spot on there about um, um, upgrading um, fiat money version 2.0. Um, is a part of what we're trying to do. So doing that collectively, um, uh, I think, is incredibly useful. Um, we don't want to turn up with the beta version and someone has the v VHS version and, um, and the world doesn't meet a little bit of what Chang Yong was saying. So, so there's that first point. Um, the other parts are there are some really critical whole of society decisions to be made that aren't within the realm of just the central bank. So even bringing people up to speed with what are the issues and then, and then bringing them along with where we're going is, is a really intensive, time-consuming task that we have. Um, you know, um, Eddie and Chang Yong are further down the path around, um, around um, experiments and tests, but um, there are some big holistic questions to be answered before we can, we can go, go forward. 
uh, I think it's important that we have to be technology uh, indifferent. Uh, we need to think much at that higher level that um, Chang Yong was talking about. Uh, we see enormous benefit, I mentioned, um, around the wholesale side. The retail side, to me, the really tricky issues will be around, whilst financial inclusion is a, is a critical goal, um, uh, for some countries they, are, they already have high levels of financial inclusion, but that means they feel comfortable at the expense of other countries who can't get access to it. In our region of the world, you know, cross-country um, cross transfers are 40 to 70 per cent of the GDP of some South Pacific Island nations, and you know, having central bank technology and capability um, simultaneous with these, with these other groups could be um, enormously advantageous. But on the other side of it, um, uh, I was chatting with uh, Governor Phil Lowe the other day around um, what chances the central bank got of introducing a uh, um, guaranteed privacy um, for use for a central bank um, digital currency, because that's what a lot of people are asking for, that's why they like cash. Uh, they have privacy for many different reasons, but can, can we really say use this, you'll get around the other laws using our own technology? It's so really complex issues that are in there beyond the technology case. Uh, not insurmountable, um, but just, you know, if we work through them methodically, I think it's important. Cecilia? Oh, a lot of good things has been said up here at the panel uh, around CBDC. I, I, uh, I, I share <coughs> many of the observations and, and, and um, uh, statements. Um, so what I would like to kind of throw into this discussion is that um, we, we do know a lot about that the convenience value uh, of advanced economies payment methods are pretty high. Uh, so that's why many says, you know, what's the case for retail CBDC? Not very convincing. Okay, um, I think we need to be a bit more ambitious than that and just kind of close the discussion and go home um, and think about what is actually What's the value of having a fiat money system? Um, if you ask economists, they can tell you down to the, a kilometer uh, how much value you get from putting up cable barriers on roads because how much value you save uh, in people's lives and protect them from injuries. Um, we don't have much answers from economists when it comes to the, the, the values we have from having structured uh, uh, monetary systems. Hmm. Uh, we don't, that we don't want to come into a situation like the Europeans were suffering in the medieval times where there were up to 500 issues of money at the same time. And you can imagine the difficulties you had. But there must be some kind of value in between there that you, you should be able to capture. Um, so if I can, we're coming up to Christmas season, if I could ask for something for a Christmas present would be economists, microeconomists looking way more into the kind of the social benefits of, of having fiat money system mm -hmm. and think about, okay, do we really have to keep that going forward? Uh, if, if the answer is yes, then you need to have a retail CBDC somewhere along the line. Yeah. Um, I also think, um, so we are pretty satisfied with payment methods in the advanced economies, but I think it, we also need to be mindful that although the private sector is super creative, when it comes to this area, they only move uh, for two reasons, either because of fear that someone else will take their business away, or greed, because you see profitability in moving. Uh, and here I think um, the public sector needs to be a bit more forceful in, in providing infrastructures that are open for innovation, that would take away these risks of, of, of the platform uh, competition aspects, as, as Susan alluded to. We call them walled gardens, uh, in, in, in where I come from. Um, so make sure that we take away some of the network issues and, and economies of scales that we actually see today. Yeah. So again, uh, make money work, update fiat money system, and provide infrastructures that um, make it possible for, for the private sector to innovate from. And if we think that the, uh, um, the, 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 the public good value 
um, in, in providing it in a sort of updated form. Yeah, then retail CBDCs will, will come down the road eventually. Different Susan? cases though. Yes? You have used wholesale, retail, complementary when it comes to CBDCs and cash. What's the way forward? So I, I think we've had a lot of good points made and I think just stepping back to some points that were made earlier about blockchain in general, there has been a sense of a hammer looking for a nail in a lot of cases. <laughs> and, you know, there's been a lot of looking for nails. Um, and, you know, it turns out that one of, I think one of the really big um, benefits of the blockchain innovation has been just that they've caused us to accelerate our innovation, but it's not always been the, the solution that you needed for every problem. And I think, you know, in, in countries that have fast payments already and financial inclusion, you know, I, I agree, like what, what's the use case inside the country? Um, the cross-border payment issue has been a much bigger challenge, and I think that's some place where there, there are use cases, both for consumers, but also business to business or bank to bank. Um, and of course, part of the problem, again, with the existing system has been market power and other forces, not just technology. Mm -hmm. But if technology gives people a way around the market power and other problems, um, then it it gets everybody, you know, gets everybody motivated, gets everybody off their butt to try to, but both the private sector and the governments to try to really fix these problems. So sometimes it's not the best solution, but seeing it as a solution also helps you unlock um, alternative solutions. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, of course, we do see bigger challenges though behind the scenes and I think it's really exciting to see what's coming. Coming back, I'm sorry, one other point on retail is that the privacy issue is really big. Um, I used to teach classes about cryptocurrency and when, before anybody was really doing anything with central bank digital currency, we would have you know, lots of discussions about the privacy issues. Um, one, and of course, if you have a, something that doesn't give people sufficient privacy, again, that's an unmet need and that may push people into other systems that do provide them privacy, but that maybe not your 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 own um, your own fiat currency. And so it, it's it's a it's a real concern that if we are offering retail products that aren't providing you know consumers and customers what they want, we it won't it, people won't stick with it, and that will create a, a minimum viable scale for privacy preserving alternatives. Before we take questions. Um Interoperability is not really the issue. Regulation is. How do you get regulation right at this point? Well, um, well this actually relates to uh, what Chan Yun said earlier. Uh, I do agree that uh, technical interoperability is not really that much of an issue. The various issues that we are tackling in Enbridge, and I think has to be tackled, not just in CBDC, but if you link up in instant payment system, you still have to tackle these issues. Things like uh, you know, who will provide liquidity and uh, how should you control that liquidity. Most of the time it's really intraday or overnight that we are providing for payment purposes. Should we do the same uh, in a CBDC platform? Uh, is those payments, at least you know, from what's designed now, is to be done in local currencies. So who's going to provide the on-chain FX liquidity? Uh, will there be market makers? Will there be an incentive for banks to join? And third, as you said, uh, regulatory harmonization is really hard. Uh, there are different regulations on AML, on capital control. Uh, how do you harmonize, not harmonize, but at least uh, pass through these barriers without unnecessarily holding back the speed of remittance, making it less efficient? So I think these are the areas that uh, we need to sort out uh, in thinking about cross-border payments using new technologies. Uh, and the last thing that we also need to solve out is incentives that keeps coming up. Uh, in any technology project, you need to think about what's the incentive for the intermediaries and the end users to adopt it. Uh, let's say cross-border uh, payment, CBDC platform. Uh, can we create some incentive for banks to actually benefit from it so that they can push that to their customers? 
the customers do see uh, you know, immediate benefits in terms of faster and cheaper payments, but how can we incentivize the intermediaries? Like Susan said, uh, they actually benefit from the current arrangement. So I think these are the, the, the issues that we need to think through in order to make any future uh, platform successful. Well, this is a really hard issue because, you know, Eddie mentioned international aspect, but uh, I already mentioned, but domestically, the perception of what is the optimal uh, regulation at this moment is quite different wide views. Generation has different perception. Younger generation and older generation has a completely different picture. And the bank and the IT company and, you know, payments uh, providers have all different uh, in incentives. So, uh, to me, and also uncertainty about future technology development is quite uncertain. So uh, we are relying on the international organization to lead us international regulatory harmonization and then follow the probably steps taken by the advanced economies. But even domestically, how to you know, meet, you know, in some sense, have a, some consensus on the, what is the optimal framework is very hard. Compared with, uh, I'm very happy that Bank of Korea is no longer the regulator. I see that uh, many others, like it has a lot of headache. And, uh, I can see quite diverse incentives as Susan mentioned. <coughs> Sorry, I don't have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's a show. I was hoping you did, Chang Yong. So, uh, um, you know, I, I probably start very. Uh, That's probably why you, we sat close together, Cecilia. Right? Yeah. So very we have strongly. The answer, so we're That's here. right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you've got the answer. I'll do another intro. The, um, I think to get regulation right is to really describe what you're trying to optimise initially and too much of the conversation around central bank digital currencies or the technology are, are specific to the technology and they're, they're as if nothing else has changed, you've just added that. Mm -hmm. But if you step back and think about trying to uh, have a, uh, a fully trusted, um, uh, where all the financial risks have been adequately identified, priced and allocated to those best able to manage, um, you know, a holistic, um, framework is is critical. Otherwise, you can rule things out, which actually could have diversified and, and reduced risk on the way through. So, I think coming holistically um, to do that, you have to be with the whole government and the whole community around that side. Um, uh, I don't think the risks actually um, uh, increase or decrease. They just shift between legal, financial, operational. Um, and reputational, you know, these these are just risks that are shifting around as new technologies come on board. So uh, what we're gonna, hoping to do is be, um, as I said, technology indifferent. Um, uh, make sure that the user knows that what's written on the tin is actually what is in the tin. That is no simple feat, as we've seen. Um, people want to want to have do it and think about what uh, we are trying to achieve for the whole of society. Um, uh, when, when we're doing that regulation. Sorry, sounding so high level, um, uh, our, uh, one of our um, consultation papers that are out there at the moment, I think we use up three pages of lists of regulations um, and laws that need to be considered domestic and international. But um, what I haven't seen is that holistic step back view. So I'm very pleased that you're doing that, Cecilia. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you very much, Adrian. Well, there's a lot of great things said again, uh, and it's hard to be the last contributor on this subject, uh, how to get regulations right. So let me, uh, let me actually post a question to Susan, uh, but let me uh, first just give a, um, a personal observation, uh, which is that yes, it's hard for regulators to keep up with the pri private sector uh, finding the most skilled people. Uh, and yes, it's hard to keep up with all this new stuff coming uh, all over us uh, and, 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 uh, and find the important things amongst all the, the smoke and mirrors. Um, so I think I would like to call for the private sector to kind of step more, more and, and think about kind of code of conducts and, and standards because it's really in their interest that we don't have too many casualties in, in, in this new brave world with uh, AI and ML and, and, and DeFi and stuff. Um, my, another observation is that I think we will have a new, maybe where they already exist, algorithm auditors, I think will be a future job to have. So my question to, to Susan, if, if you can hear me, is do you think we, um, 
have, do we have the right balance between the private sector and the public sector regarding regulation and oversight when it comes to, for example, ML and AI? Do you think the private sector could do more and, and kind of self-regulate and self-supervise? Um, and or what, what would you like to see? That's a great question. And I think there's a few ans different answers, actually. I think for the algorithmic auditing, it's actually very difficult for a company to audit itself. It has no credibility. Um, and I think we've seen with more controversial topics, like say content moderation, um, you know, it's, it's, it's actually kind of hard for a company to win. Uh, and everybody thinks you're being, you're being bad to them. So there can be a real benefit to companies to have third parties. We see third parties in the US around um, auditing credit scoring models for fairness. Mm -hmm. um, the, the regulatory framework is a bit outdated mm -hmm. and, it, and there's been a lot of push in the fairness and AI and ML community and in the economics community to update that regulatory framework to better address what's happening today. Uh, but in general, um, having sort of trusted third parties or um, you know, giving some guidance to third parties and letting third parties do it is, is good. The research is actually not definitive right now. We don't actually have agreement on exactly what it means for an algorithm to be fair. There's different notions of fairness. There's different trade-offs, for example. Just fairness is one example that's been most studied. There are other elements of algorithms, like their fragility. Um, and you know, if you have some, a big shock, something like COVID, you know, do they break? Mm -hmm. we, the machine learning community has not fully resolved those issues either. And again, that's something that needs to be done. So it, at Stanford, we founded this institute that was partly trying to push for research and policy papers that would help provide guidance it's also important that stakeholders are represented, and so that's a reason to involve stakeholders outside of industry as well as industry. But industry doesn't necessarily lose if other stakeholders are involved, because again, there's some downside to being the one who's making the rules. It's a little easier if someone else makes the rules and you need to follow them, it gives you some cover <laughs> if things go wrong. Things like, you know, if you discover accidentally that your consumer is gam has a gambling habit because you see it in their financial records, what's your responsibility? What should you do? Is that really something the bank should be deciding or is that something society should be deciding? But the government needs to play, and I think governments and universities need to play an important role in framing the questions and in convening this so that we can accelerate our, our progress here because our progress has really been way too slow in in this so we need more research dollars we need convening we need and we need best practices that can be implemented on some other things i think the private sector should be contributing should be contributing talent and expertise and we just have to really guard against that regulatory capture mm -hmm. because we have seen things like privacy regulation or other things get co-opted in a way that really benefits big firms mm -hmm. and makes things harder for small firms. So that's like the cautionary tale in, all, in having the firms involved. Let's take questions from the floor, if there's any. Thank you. Excellent panel, uh, very interesting opinions. I mean, needless to say, I'm very pro CBDC and the decisiveness of authorities to step in into this field. And I wonder if, uh, in this respect, we're not ambitious enough as uh, authorities. And this is a question for you. I mean, for example, you, Eddie, you mentioned. Well, we have to find what is the business case for CBDC. My question is, that, is that the only answer, the only, the only question? Shouldn't we answer other questions? For example, are we sure that completely delegating the payment system to the private sector is the right solution? I mean, we are now, we, we, you talked about incentives, you all talked about incentives, including Susan. 
what what could be a better incentive than having the competitiveness of a central bank center payment system to improve the private sector? Yeah. We delegated the prime, prime payment system to the private sector many decades ago. And well, the final result is for many, many years, they milk this cow until other private sectors trying to challenge it. But we're very, very concerned about protecting the industry. And we don't subject them to competition. We also should ask ourselves wh what other externalities can have CBDC have? For example, for program programmability, you know? Behind many of these, these developments of, of, let me put it in a simplistic way, privately led developments, there is, always the pers there is always the put of us coming in to clean up the mess. And uh, do we really want to carry that, that risk forever, no? Uh, we have instances of coordination, like for payments. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, you know, we can put some meaning to the BIS name. You know, I mean, we have settlements. Uh, that's a, we don't do much settlements today, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so we can provide some meaning to the BIS name. Uh, so I mean, I think sometimes we probably are not ambition ambitious enough about providing a public good that can be for benefit to everything. I mean, at the end of the day there is a public good aspect in, in, in providing trusted money. Yeah. And, 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 and my sense is that probably we don't step up to that challenge all the time. And we're trying to justify why remaining a, a tame, I would say, or contained is what is leading many of our decisions. So I would like to throw this provocative thought to you, see how, how you react. And, well, may, maybe I'll start first. Um, I, I actually agree that we should be uh, progressive in thinking about the retail or common use, or general use of CBDC, CBDC. And that's actually why when we published our findings uh, a few months ago, we are saying that we want to make ourselves fully prepared. So we actually will be building the technical foundation, the infrastructure that's needed, because we're thinking about a two-tier system. Uh, we will be amend we're actually preparing a law uh, so that we can do it very, very quickly. Uh, we will be doing security uh, type of uh, pilots to make sure that we're, we're ready. But when we think about um, the rolling out, which is what we call the third rail, we need to make sure that the second rail, which is the use case, is there. The reason being that you know, if you think back about um, instant payment systems, the use case is very clear because peer-to-peer -peer uh, payments is cumbersome, not convenient. So after we roll it out in just a few years, we've got more than 10 million uh, registration. The use case is very clear. But for the retail CBDC, if there's no use case, we're really worried about adoption. You know, we, we should be prepared, but it's, it's not like if there's no use case, then we will not do it. It's more like we are ready, but hey, private sector, let's think about the use case. Is it about tokenized assets? Is it about the metaverse or NFT transactions? Or is it about, are, are, or, or are you creative enough to suggest the use of retail CBDC in everyday transaction in place of credit cards or other payment methods? So because we're, we're, we're not the kind of like user interface, and that's actually what we're exploring with the banks. They are much better in creating products, in finding use cases, and that's actually what I meant by use case. But if in the end, after like that one year exploration, there's no convincing use case, we'll just wait. Maybe you know, tokenized assets will become a lot more popular in two or three years' time. Then it might be the time to roll that out. So that, that's actually uh, the way that we look at it. Cheng Yang? I think Augustine's always is uh, modest. And I, think, I don't think the PIS is not ambitious enough. I think uh, we got a lot of support from BIS, especially this issue is quite international. Uh, you know, it's one country cannot address this issue. So what you have been doing so far is a lot of good reference for us to think about ahead, especially wholesale side too. 
Uh, so I think uh, I cannot say that you are less ambitious than. But I also, I mean, like you, I always ask whenever this question coming in, whether uh, I'm using the regulatory issue as a uh, way to protect incumbent or even our own businesses. So I have to ask myself uh, whether I can judge these things from a perspective of younger generation who are more familiar with technology rather than my peers. So we have to keep on asking these questions on this issue. And having said that, actually, I think uh, you know, I cannot more than agree with uh, uh, what Eddie says. When I was a little bit uh, negative or cautious in detail of CBDC, this is exactly this region. We believe that private sector uh, can do much better job in a client face, uh, you know, facing client's need directly. And also, we have to do the pilot. But in order to do the pilot with a real terminal client, the total investment need for this pilot is huge. And after that, you know, uh, if the advanced economies adopt different systems, we'll be in trouble, right? So we want to be more cautious in that sense. But I think, for example, like uh, your report mentions the tokenization of the deposit. So now we are thinking about whether that can be a next step for our ex, uh, you know, experiment on the retail CBDC, not just thinking about the final uh, you know, end users, but thinking about two-tier system. So we're going to use issue the retail CBDC, and then our bank can probably tokenize the deposit and see how it goes. So, so we are moving step by step. But I think uh, let me assure you that uh, you are not less ambitious than others. <laughs> yeah. And I just, just want to say, I mean, appetite is very strong um, at the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. I always think, um, starting from a position of why shouldn't we do this as opposed to why should we, is a far more effective way of going forward um, and with the whole holistic public good component. Because, uh, you know, some of it is a real existential threat to fiat currencies if we aren't really being ambitious and being involved and it is embedding incumbents and um, you know, being uh, the recipient of some very dominated, concentrated banking sectors, it's, it's, it's not optimal. It's just how it is and we need to break through it. And I really love um, what everyone has said. Even the fear of us entering is creating enormous um, dialogue, challenge, e efficiencies already. So uh, whether it's switched on at the retail end or not, the fact is ready. Um, you know, it was, um, is very powerful. So, so our questions is why aren't we doing it as opposed to why should we be doing it? Uh, thank you. It's interesting to, uh, to, to listen to all of this uh, speaker. Well, the essence of central bank is to provide the medium of payment, right? In the 17th century, that's private, but uh, later on then, uh, central bank fiat money. Mm -hmm. What is digital currency? It's just another medium of exchange. Right? So where is the role of the central bank? Then one must assure about the digital medium of payment under the central bank. Hmm. Whether you call it CBDC, you call it digital, it doesn't matter. Whether you want to talk, tokenize, it's but the ASEAN is the, the role of the central bank to provide the medium of payment system for the country. I think that's, that's, that's one thing. And the second <coughs> is, of course, the providing the public infrastructure. Right? Then we're talking the democratic needs. Whether if our democratic, the, media, uh, the infrastructure or the payment system is digitalized payment system or CBDC. Probably different in developed countries and emerging. In Indonesia, if we want to get our digitalization or inclusion with our SME, our SME do not need digital CBDC, right? What they need is QR, fast payment. For financial inclusion, the need of the central bank to provide the public infrastructure more on the digital payment system rather than CBDC, probably on the advanced country where millennials needed the digital currency, they need digital currency. But this is where actually the role of central bank to cater the need of the customer, the society, different group of the society, they are need different medium of payment system. They still need the paper money, they still need the on money, but they still need digital currency. 
and digital currency can be delivered through digital payment system, retail digital payment, and or CBDC. I think that's, that's uh, the, but the choices different country. In Indonesia, for financial inclusion, we go to digital payment system. Much more direct need, get at the need of our SME and retail payment. Because digital currency, it's just used for, you know, the new, new young millennial metaverse and so on. For the whole system, they need more on the digital uh, payment. The third role of the central bank across border is reinventing the Brenton Wood in digital currency area. This is where a regional payment system of the ASEAN 5, where we are already agreeing a multilateral connectivity of digital payment on the QR, fast payment, local currency, and other infrastructure of the payment system, then we have to move. We have to talk among the ASEAN 5 Central Bank, how is the exchange rate arrangement? How is Article 8 of the IMF? How to determine the exchange rate of the rupiah and Singapore dollar and baht through the digital uh, currency? This is exchange rate, this is reinventing the, the Bretton word. How about capital flows management, resident, non-resident, through the digital? But of course, about the surveillance. How to surveillance of those, uh, you know, uh, digital payment area or CBDC uh, about the uh, operational, about standardization, and, and so on. So the third aspect of the role of central bank across borders, reinventing the bread in digital area. So come back again. I do not think this is about competition. Like, let us ourselves. What is the role of the central bank in digital area? One, providing the digital medium of exchange. We call it CBDC, we call it whatever, this digital medium. Second, to, to provide public infrastructure to cater the need of society. Some society need retail CBDC, but in Indonesia, more need is digital payment system in retail rather than CBDC. But the third is, of course, cross-border cooperation, reinventing again, exchange rate arrangement, capital flows management, uh, surveillance. Uh, Christian, you were, uh, you were there in the, in the, how is the role of the IMAP in the digital area? Thank you. Let's get uh, the perspective from Ravi Man and his. Um... Thank you. Uh, <coughs> girl Stan. Uh, maybe <laughs> instead of asking the question about uh, whether we should issue retail CBDC, what, why don't we ask three other questions? How much to issue? Where does the retail CBDC fit in the money supply and monetary mm -hmm. aggregates? And three, for what purpose? Because I think we should avoid these binary choices. I think as all of us agree, I think all our central banks are working to build up the technological, institutional, and governance infrastructure to issue retail CBDC. Is that, uh, like Eddie and Changyong, I think that is not a compelling case, case uh, use case. Uh, so maybe if we ask how much we want to issue, that focuses the mind better. Today, global money supply, 8% is in notes and coins which are direct liabilities of the central bank. 92% is in form of bank deposits. We are already in a world where the bulk of the money we use is privately issued by banks, whom we regulate tightly. Uh, in the advanced economies, I think it's probably closer to 5%. So the question is, if we issue retail CBDCs, are we seeking to replace part or all of that cash component? Because a retail CBDC is digital cash. So are we, is that what we're trying to do? Or are we trying to replace part of bank deposits? And as Chang Yang pointed out very well, and Eddie as well, uh, you can get the same programmability benefits of retail CBDC by tokenizing the deposits in the banks. And uh, you can set up a regulatory structure to do that. And it will perform the same functions. Just as bank deposits perform the functions of money, uh, tokenized deposits can do so with programmability. So I think those are the interesting questions that we, we should ask. I think all of us would probably issue it. Question is how much? and and where does it fit in the monetary aggregates? Because if you issue retail CBDC on top of your issue of your uh, notes and coins and central bank reserves with the banking system, you're adding to the monetary base. So you need to think through what does it mean for money supply and money multipliers. Um, and the transmission mechanism is very different. So we need clarity on where it fits in the monetary aggregates. 
Third is for what purpose? And I think there are purpose, there are use cases. And um, one way to think about it is, what is programmability going to be used for? And if you think of the notion of purpose-driven money, if I want to give money to my kids and make sure they don't buy Coke and sugary drinks and they buy good healthy food, today I can't do that, right? <laughs> because money is fungible. <laughs> programmability means I can program that into the money. And if they operate on chain and the merchant has the same, f uh, is part of that chain, I can do that. Give a more realistic example, charities. When we give to charities, you can program, theoretically, uh, the ultimate beneficiary receives it for specified purposes that I intend to give to charity rather than give to the charity and not know how it is being used. The ultimate is fiscal transfers. The last two years, our governments have been injecting massive amounts of fiscal dollars into the system. If you want to direct it, and this is not for the central bank to decide, because we are neutral as to the use of money. We provide the medium of exchange. But if the central, if the government decides this injection of money is programmed and purpose-driven to pursue retraining, to pursue infrastructure, but not to pursue other kinds of expenditures, theoretically that can be programmed into a retail CBDC and transmitted through the banking system or to final users. So I think it'll be more fruitful if we thought of specific use cases and we can think of specific use cases for retail CBDC. So I would submit that maybe it's more interesting to ask how much to issue, uh, how does it figure in the monetary aggregates, and for what purpose. Then it focuses the mind rather than have an abstract discussion. Thank you. Cecilia, you wanted to add? All right, I'll, I'll go abstract perhaps. But I, I do think uh, we have no idea about what possible use cases uh, um, there is. We, we, we think we know what use cases there is today. But uh, who knows about tomorrow and, 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 and longer time in the future? I mean, look at Apple, who, I mean, this example is not mine, but I'll borrow it. Um, <laughs> they came up with an iPhone in um, 14 years ago, 15 years ago. Why did they do that? There were a lot of different mobile phone operators out, out there. Um, and I'm pretty sure, uh, but they did, and I'm pretty sure that the producers of Compasses, those who did travel agency, producers of alarm clocks, producers of records, and I can go on, uh, had no idea what was going to hit them. Uh, and that's uh, the charm and the scary bits with the future. We don't know what it, what it contains. So I, I think we should be, um, I'm, I'm certainly very humble about these things, uh, but since we don't know, uh, we need to stay alert. Uh, Eddie's approach of kind of being prepared is probably uh, uh, the best one to be. Um, but uh, we shouldn't pretend that uh, we, we, just because we don't see the clear use cases today in advanced economies, that that is a stable situation because it will not be stable. Final word from Madame Lagarde. Thank you very much. I, I just wanted to follow up on both Eddie and, and Ravi, actually, because you, your point is well taken that we have the 8% of essentially banknotes, coins on the one hand, and the 92% of commercial money. But it's because we have the 8% that we have the 92%. Yeah, yeah. Given that it takes about, what, 10, 12 years to eventually come up with a product that will fly, that will be user-friendly, that will be low cost, we should get ready that in two, 10 years' time, your kids will simply not want to carry those banknotes and those coins. And that 8%, it might not be 8%, it might be 6%, because we will keep the 2% of banknotes and coins that some people cherish. But that 6% would have to be in, in CBDC that takes a while to build. Yeah. Fascinating discussion, lots of questions still to be thought about. Please join me in thanking our panelists today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well done, well done.